Tonight, I'm going to be addressing my favorite topic, uh, which is the, the history of underwear. And I know that everyone has a lot of conceptions about what people used to wear. Uh, this is one of my favorite ads here on the near side, a maiden form ad from the early 90s that says, isn't it nice to live at a time when women aren't being pushed around so much anymore? And of course, we all have that image of Scarlett O'Hara in the 1939 film Gone with the Wind, holding onto the bedpost as she's laced into her corset by Mammy. But what I want to do today is to look at both the fashions themselves and the under fashions and see how the changing ideal of the female body has really affected what we think of as beautiful, as natural, as normal. And really, as you can see in these two Goya paintings of the closed and nude Maha from about 1800, clothes and uh, underclothes really imprint themselves on the body even when they're not worn. So our idea of what the ideal female body should look at has changed dramatically over time. Of course, the female body can be interpreted in a lot of different ways. Uh, you can see that in these two uh, prehistoric figures on the near side, the Venus of Villendorf from 15,000 to 10,000 BC, a fetish figure that accentuates all of the fecundity of the female figure, and on the far side, the Cycladic idol that makes it, the female figure much more angular and has a very different look. And we'll see this happening over and over again. And certainly the female figure has a lot of fleshy parts that can be pushed around and emphasized uh, at different times. The Cretan uh, snake goddess on the near side uh, from about 1500 BC really, of course, emphasizes the bust line, something that distinguishes uh, the feminine uh, torso from that of the male. And one of the rare depictions we have in the early years of what women might have worn under their generally flowing robes is this a Roman uh, um, depiction from the 3rd or 4th century AD from the Piazza Armorini of women exercising, wearing some kind of band to support the bust line and what looks remarkably similar to bikini underpants today. But skipping over about a thousand years, uh, since I do only have an hour here, we're going to start in the medieval period when you can see that the, the ideal of the female um, figure is very different than our conception. The uh, ideal figure is shown here in this depiction uh, uh, from about 1475 by Hugo van der Goes on the near side with a very small bust line and a rounded, curvaceous stomach emphasizing again a female fecundity. And this uh, has an influence on what was worn over the figure, of course, the marriage of Arnolfini on the far side from earlier in the 15th century, uh, where the, um, everything is done to help give that woman her, the ideal of the time. She's really standing, leaning back. Her very, very long skirt here that's fur-lined um, is too long, so she's holding it up over her stomach. Everything is done to help her attain that posture. And so what we're going to look at tonight is really different ways that, that women have tried to achieve the ideals. Now, already by this time, uh, men and women wore a, a layer of undergarments next to the skin whose main purpose was to absorb bodily perspiration and soils and protect the outer clothes from the, um, from the body itself. Uh, now, I'm not going to use the pointer, but if you look closely at the um, image on the near side, which is a detail from the trebuchet de Duc de Berry from the early 15th century, you can see that neither the man nor the woman has, um, in, in the background there, has any kind of um, underpants or drawers on. They both have long, uh, linen garments on that protect their clothes again. And they are, uh, this garment was universally worn by all classes. Uh, it was much heavier and rougher for the poorer peasants, such as are depicted here. Whereas on the far side, in Botticelli's depiction, you can see what the upper classes could afford, this incredibly fine linen that's really transparent. These, uh, although they're the three graces uh, by Botticelli, they are wearing real garments. And this woman here has the collar of her garment just draped over one shoulder, making it look um, a bit more idealized. But you can see the fineness of the linen that would be a real status symbol if you could afford uh, to buy it. Uh, by the time we get to the 16th century, there is, clothes are really making a statement about social status, and that was one of their primary functions. Those few people who could afford to wear the elaborate fashions of the time wanted to make their, their 
elite status very clear. Here is Elizabeth I of England, depicted by Geraint in 1592. Um, everything about her is grandiose, and indeed, she's standing on England. She's really bigger than the entire country. Um, showing her power and her influence, but all of her clothes go to show off the incredibly expensive fabric that she's wearing. Her skirt is supported by a farthingale that helps hold it out. There's an extra fold of fabric here that's looped back over and pinned in place to make this skirt as big as possible. Her sleeves are large. She has hanging um, sleeves as well. So all of this incredibly expensive material really showing her status and power. And you'll notice, too, that the conception of the female torso is very distinct at this period and remains uh, this way for, for quite a period of time. It's like an ice cream cone shape, a conical form, very different from our conception of the female torso. This is one of the rare survivals of uh, a corset from that period that gives you that ice cream cone-like shape with that very long point. Now, I hasten to add that although you may see this in books published as if this was what was being worn, scholars um, are sure that this was indeed a medical device that was used by women who had curvature of the spine or, or some other disease. So this would not have been what was typically worn, which would have been made of linen and stiffened with uh, reeds or something like that. But what this does do is give us the shape that was the ideal. It also has little holes around the top here and around the back. So it would have been lined with a leather lining, so it's not quite the torture chamber it looks like. But you can see there's no lift and separate going on here at all. <laughs> the bust line is very flattened, and it has this incredibly long point, and it's about the taper down to the waist that then sets off this very, very full skirt. The uh, corset or stays, as they were called at this time, was always worn over an undergarment again to protect it and the outer um, layers of clothes. Rembrandt depicts it in 1654 here on this woman bathing in a stream. It's a very loose garment that um, is shaped then by the outer garments and undergarments that are over it. So it is really made of the fabric as it comes off the loom loom of linen because linen was washable and that was an important function. This is a, a 150 years later, but the same garment still made in the same way with the fabric straight off the loom here up over the shoulders and then these triangular pieces or gores adding fullness at the hem and little triangular pieces under the sleeves so no fabric was wasted and this was the basic garment that women wore for centuries and centuries. And of course having these cleaned was uh, again a status symbol. This is a detail from a depiction of a uh, laundry in Flanders in about 1621, showing all of these garments, both household linens and also you can see some T-shaped garments that are men's shirts or women's smocks or shifts spread on the lawn. Having your clothes cleaned was a great expense and a great deal of trouble, so if you could pay to have them done, it was really showing your status. Uh, they were laid um, on the lawn because the action of the um, sunlight and the chlorophyll from the grass actually works as a natural bleach bleaching agent, so that was one way to get things very white. And then if you could afford to, you had them starched and ironed by someone else so that this beautiful crisp uh, white linen was really something that showed everyone you could pay to have this done. But what we don't have at all in these periods is any form of drawers or underpants for women. Women wore the smock or shift that came to below the knee and then layers of petticoats and skirts over that. Um, so they really didn't need to wear anything, um, any kind of bifurcated garment next to the skin. And in fact, today any gynecologist will tell you that it's much healthier not to have close-fitting garments in the feminine nether regions. Um, I think you can see very clearly if you look at the depiction by Boucher from uh, 1742 called La Toilette en Team, which shows a woman answering the call of nature. So again, not having garments that you had to remove was very practical. She is using what's called a bordeloo, and that's one of these sort of portable chamber pots here. Um, they were said to be named after a French preacher who preached for so long in church that women would have to go behind a screen to relieve themselves. And I always think that there must be a lot of these in museum collections that are labeled as gravy boats. Uh, but at any rate, 
it was just very practical not to have any kind of doors, and that remained the case for centuries and centuries. But I think if you know this about the past, you can look at certain works of art, like perhaps uh, Fragonard's The Swing from 1767, and just have a whole new interpretation of what might be going on there. Now maybe he, the young man is only trying to catch a glimpse of her garters like those uh, beautiful embroidered ones from the Philadelphia Museum's collection on the far side that were tied above or below the knee to hold up her stockings. But just because they didn't wear underpants doesn't mean that women wore no underwear. In fact, in the 18th century, the whole idea was to wear um, some incredibly restrictive underwear, as we'll see, but to look as if you were perfectly free and easy. So we have these two depictions from about 1760 that really show the essence of Rococo taste. Madame de Pompadour by Boucher again. Everything is light and frivolous and easy. She looks so relaxed. Everything is feminine and delicate. Uh, the um, dress on the far side from the Philadelphia Museum's collection shows the same thing, these serpentine curving lines, all lightness and airiness. Um, but this is all built over a very rigid foundation. So the whole idea of being natural in the 18th century was really based on nature taken to its fullest point of perfection. They believed that nature unrefined was not true nature. Nature needed to be refined in order to be the best. They used the analogy of a diamond. Until it's polished, it's of no use and has no brilliance. So they believed that uh, one should undergo a polishing process until one is the most natural. And then one could look as if one were totally free and easy. So young children who were well-bred were taught from an early age by the dancing master not only the complicated steps of the minuet, but exactly how to hold their bodies, how to do every motion, so that by the time they were grown up, they could do all of these things and look as if it was uh, natural. And young children, both boys and girls, were put into stays or corsets from a very early age to help them develop naturally and most beautifully. The stays, and this is one from the Philadelphia's collection, and it's for a very tiny child. It measures five and three quarter inches up the center front. So it's for perhaps an 18 month old or two year old child. And again, this wasn't thought of as something that was being harmful to the child. It was thought of as helping them develop to hold their shoulders back and their chests out so that they would be the most perfect um, form that they could be. And it's rather like we think children need to learn how to walk in shoes. Uh, you know, that's just something you need to do. Now, both boys and girls would wear these if they were well-bred, but um, boys would leave off wearing stays by about the age of 10 or so when they were thought to have developed this posture. But girls, of course, went on wearing them into adulthood. And this is a surviving example of a pair of stays from the Kyoto costume collection, uh, which has the beautiful conical shape, again, still no emphasis on the bust line, but really on the taper, down to that low point. There are 162 different pieces of whalebone that are used to make this shape. Now, whalebone is more properly known as baleen, and it's not actually a bone. It's the cartilage from certain whales' jaws that they use to strain um, plankton and to eat. And these are baleen plates in the jaw of a bowhead whale in an early photograph. And the amazing thing about baleen in the pre-plastic age is it, it can bend and return to shape, so there's some flexibility to it. So if you could afford to have baleen, this was what was preferred for boning the stays. If you couldn't afford it, and there are um, examples in museums, we have one, you might use splits of wood or something, and the one that we have is all broken at the waistline because if you bend too far, they just crack and poke out. So it was a very inferior substitute. So um, baleen or whalebone was used for, for um, several centuries to give this beautiful shape. This is an example from our collection of uh, mid-18th century pair of stays. And you can see the shape again. It really, this, um, the stays won't lie flat on the paper to be photographed. It has a shape that it will impose on the torso and help to shape you in the form that was desired. Um, it's, uh, this one is made of green a wool twill and then reinforced with leather around the back. And again, these only laced up the back, so you needed quite a bit of pressure to lace them up. And the top and bottom is also reinforced with um, white kid leather so that the baleen won't wear through. 
Uh, to further help reinforce that shape, once you had your stays on over your smock or, sh or shift, a woman could insert a busk, that's B-U-S-K, down the center front between the two, and this would help ensure that there was no bending at the waist. These are three examples in wood, metal, and whalebone ivory from the Philadelphia collection. Um, so you really had this very stiff torso um, that was this perfect ideal. Now, men were the ones who made stays in the 18th century and fit them on women on, as well because it was thought that you needed a lot of strength to be able to thrust the baleen into the casings, but women were the ones who sewed them. And you can see on this detail of the stays I showed you, all of these casings for all the separate bones, all of them backstitched, which is a very strong stitch, and then the binding around the bottom, uh, the decorative um, kid going up where the seams are, and then this reinforcement up the back where you really needed quite a lot of pressure to pull um, on these hand-stitched eyelets. Uh, and this caricature from about 1775 is, I think, where they got the idea for that scene in Gone with the Wind with the holding on to the bed pole. You can see everyone here working to pull in uh, the back laces of a women's pair of stays. And note the beautiful conical shape that she has to that torso. Something else to notice is this um, garment hanging down the side here. This is a pocket, which in the 18th century was a separate garment that could be tied around the waist, either singly or in pairs, and uh, worn under the skirts. Uh, the pocket, and these are three from Philadelphia on the far side in different materials, was just a teardrop shape and had a slit that you then had a corresponding slits in the outer garment and the petticoat so you could reach through all of these slits and get into your pocket. And if you know the uh, nursery rhyme about Lucy Lockett losing her pocket, it must have come undone from her waist and fallen on the, on the ground. Uh, women could keep all of the things because they didn't carry handbags at this time, so they could keep everything that we would keep in a handbag, handkerchiefs and so forth. And if you think that might be a little bit too bulky under your skirts in the, in the 18th century, it really wasn't a problem at the time because very full skirts were once again in fashion. The um, hoop petticoat or pannier had come in in the early 18th century, about 1710, and taken various forms. It was dome-shaped earlier in the century, but by mid-century, you can see that having a lot in a pocket was not going to be uh, difficult here. These are some of the extremes of the wide hoop petticoats of the time, worn, I assure you, only at the most formal occasions for court by those uh, few who are at the very top of society. The red dress is preserved at the Victorian Albert Museum. It dates to about 1745 um, and is all embroidered in gold thread. So the fact that you can afford to buy that much fabric with this incredibly expensive material and just the fabric and silk itself was expensive with then the metallic embroidery on it really showed that you were someone in society. And you also showed your status by having to learn how to maneuver this incredibly complicated um, garment. You can see the women in the 1770s engraving there having to go through a doorway sideways and of course there, there were all sorts of other complications so handling one of these was a skill that needed to be learned. This is a far more um, everyday one, far more typical, uh, and a rare survival, again surviving at the Kyoto Costume Institute, this um, uh, hoop petticoat here with um, caning around to hold it out. You can see the bottom of her smock or shift there um, in this uh, typical um, set of undergarments from the time, so it's great to have that survival. But again, we have to remember this 18th century conception of nature as encompassing all of what to us seems to be amazing hindrances and artificialities. So I love this painting by Gainsborough from the mid-18th century. This idyllic English landscape, this woman with her enormous hoop skirt, and her husband here is sort of casually resting his arm on her hoop skirt like it's a, some kind of armchair. It's just accepted as part of um, the world around them. But already by the 1770s and 1780s, the idea of nature is, is changing. You have the idea of the noble savage, the influence of Rousseau, looking back to the classical period. So that while these incredibly wide hoop skirts go on being worn at court, as you see Marie Antoinette here on the near side in 1780, depicted by Vijay Lebrun, 
they are really out of fashion for the rest uh, of society. And in fact, Marie Antoinette, depicted by the same artist three years later, is in a very different style of gown. Uh, what looked to most people at the time really like underwear. It's called a chemise dress or a chemise a la reine. And when this painting was exhibited publicly, it caused such a scandal that it had to be withdrawn because it was just thought to be so shocking to see the Queen of France in what looked to everyone but she was, of course, um, one of the, uh, those who really kept up with the fashion, loved the pastoral, loved the influence of the country modes that were, were coming in more and more in the 1780s. So by about 1785, you have this fashion plate. Gone is this emphasis on the wide side to side. Instead, you have a little bit of a kick at the back of the skirt here, um, held up with some kind of pad, and a lot of emphasis on having a very full, rounded bust line, um, often uh, with a handkerchief or neckerchief poofing that up. So a whole new conception of what the female body looks like. This is a depiction <laughs> from 1786. Um, called A Modern Venus, drawn by Miss Hoare of Bath, so showing uh, really a, a, a quite a change in, in uh, what the ideal female should look like now. And indeed, by about 1800, the neoclassical influence had really taken hold, and women and fashion were looking back to ancient Greece and Rome and, and the statuary of the time uh, for a very different line. Waists were now right under the bust line in imitation of the classical look. Fabrics were much softer and drapier, and really they had, at least according to the caricaturists, discarded almost all of their underwear. This is a wonderful depiction from 1799, predicting uh, what Parisian ladies will wear for winter in 18. And you can see that the uh, caricaturist is showing them with very little on indeed. Now, of course, some young women might be able to get away with this. And the, the portrait on the far side, also from about 1800, from the Circle of David, really makes it very clear that she has uh, next to nothing or nothing on underneath that very sheer white cotton gown. Uh, but again, most women need some help to achieve the ideal. And now that there is all this emphasis on the, on the bust line, uh, women really uh, worked to get that bust to be um, as full as possible. This is a Lawrence painting from 1803 um, that, that shows you the new ideal for the bust line. And on the far side, a typical dress from the period showing just how much construction of the outer garment can help. Uh, here you have the front of the dress, which is folded down. It has slits on the side, and it has this apron front. Uh, and then this comes up. There are under flaps under the bust that almost work like a uh, support and are pinned together to really give some support to the bust. And then the front flap folds up in buttons here and ties under the bust, again, helping to support it. And then look at how closely the back shoulders are cut. They really force you to hold your shoulders back to help put emphasis on the bust line. And finally, notice this little tiny pad here at the very back. There's a lot of gathering in the back so that the back would flow out in a graceful line. And that little pad ensures that it will flow gracefully and not cling to the small of the back in an ungraceful way. So everything about the dress construction, even of these what look to be very simple dresses, is working to get the new um, ideal. And of course, for most women, still need some kind of support to help achieve the ideal. This is a, a caricature from 1810 by Gilray um, that shows a woman putting on her stays. And you can see now that um, corsets or stays are, are now a very different shape than before to conform to this new ideal. Uh, this is a, one from our, the Philadelphia's collection on the far side showing these triangular shapes or gores that are now inserted at both the bust and the hip line to give much more of a rounded figure. You can see them here too on this woman. Yet they still have the busk uh, down the center front. That's what she's inserting here. And ours uh, has one as well, this wooden busk that goes into a pocket now built right into the uh, corset and helps to separate the, the bust line. So really, even though these look uh, very uh, unconfining, some of these clothes uh, had, a, had more of a rigid understructure underneath. But even the neoclassical period, although it lasted for 20 or 30 years, was on its way out by the late 1820s. And women's waists started to get lower and lower. And 
there was more emphasis on having a small waist. So once again, women used the laws of proportion to help their waist look small. Skirts got wider and wider and wider, and sleeves got bigger and bigger as this emphasis on having a tiny waist uh, went on. This is a great uh, cartoon from about 1830 that says, a correct view of the new machine for winding up the ladies, and you have the maid there as she's struggling to, um, to lace up this corset. But you'll notice that the big sleeves and the big skirt really help make the waist look smaller. And in fact, in the late 1820s and early 1830s, these enormous sleeves were very fashionable. Once again, on the far side, a caricature of how these sleeves were achieved, and not at all the correct view, but here's the maid here using a straw to blow up the sleeves. <clears throat> but what was actually used were these wonderful little puffs or sleeve supports made in a donut shape and filled with down. Because the ideal, as our, this dress from about 1830 shows, is this very sloped shoulder line here within these enormous balloon sleeves, very soft. Um, and if you have a sleeve that is bigger than your waist, of course your waist is, is uh, proportionally much diminished. So this was, was uh, these giant leg of mutton sleeves were in fashion for 10 or 15 years. By the time we get to the Victorian period, the feminine ideal was very distinct from the masculine ideal. Men were to be out in the world, conducting business, doing practical things, having all the power. Women, ideally, were to be at home, concerned with the family and home life. They were thought of as ideally ethereal beings, angels, etc., perfectly exemplified by the ballerina Marie Taglioni that you see on the near side. And everything about their dress was meant to reinforce these, uh, the differences between the two sexes. Uh, Winterhalter depicts uh, the Queen of the Belgians in 1846 in this ultra-feminine look, her spaniel curls, the low neckline, the lace, the colors, the full skirts, everything contrasts with the, the business suit that men were wearing by now. So this idea of what was suitable, of course, emphasized a very small waist again as distinguishing uh, women from men. So the corsets of the time really helped to give this hourglass shape that was now desirable. This is a German uh, view showing the front of a corset, again with these triangular gores at the bust and the hip line, and the back view. The corsets at this time still laced only up the back so that you needed help from a mother, or sister, maid, or a husband to get into them in the morning and to get out of them at night. But you can really see now that we have in the 1840s the evidence of photography as well, just how much uh, the corset affects the way that a woman's torso is shaped and how even how she's sitting. Uh, you can really see that underneath. It's almost as if you can see the corset right through the dress. Uh, it really shapes the torso. Notice, too, this beautiful bottleneck, this sloped shoulder line, and how low the arms eyes are set here. So she really couldn't raise her arm up a lot, but it gave that line that was so desirable at the time. Now, of course, just because women were meant to be these angelic creatures doesn't mean that all of them uh, necessarily were. Of course, most women, uh, middle class women especially, had a lot of very heavy work to do around the house in the age before labor saving devices. The posed photograph on the near side shows women doing, uh, using uh, a uh, washing clothes, using this dolly mop to really, uh, a lot of physical labor required, having to haul all the water and so forth. And women were not necessarily the angels, they were meant to be in other ways as well. On the far side is a cartoon from 1840 by Gavarni that shows a husband uh, getting his wife out of her corset at the end of the day and discovering something different. He says, hmm, upon my word, how odd. This morning I tied a knot in this lace, and now there's a bow. <laughs> but just how firmly ingrained clothes and the idea of what was suitable for the two genders were can be seen in the early 1850s controversy about the Bloomer costume. Here on the near side is Mrs. Amelia Bloomer wearing what to us, I think, looks like a rather modest um, costume. She was one of a few women who believed that women should have more power in society, but they would never get anywhere if they were weighted down by their clothes, these very impractical clothes. So what they proposed, and she did not invent it, but her name 
came to be associated with it was to have a less, slightly less constricting bodice and to shorten the skirt so that the petticoats and skirts were not dragging in the street. But of course you couldn't just have your leg uh, revealed for everyone to see so they filled that bottom gap in with some form of loose trousers. Well, this was absolutely amazing to people who had never seen women in trousers before. Women, remember, were still respectable women, not wearing any kind of bifurcated garment, even as underwear. So pants or trousers had come to be associated with men and men's power. So the minute women put these on, they were ridiculed and the satirists had a field day. This is one of many cartoons on the far side that show women uh, assuming all the roles of men of the time. Here they are hanging around on street corners smoking cigars. Uh, other cartoons show, show them proposing marriage to bashful young men. The whole world was really tipped on its head because women were trying to adopt uh, masculine prerogatives just through adopting these clothes. And indeed this American image from 1855 shows that age-old question as women are trying to gather power, who wears the pants? Something that still affects how we think because so firmly ingrained were these garments with the idea of men having power, women uh, being much more the submissive creatures. So this French uh, lithograph here shows a woman kind of bowing down to the power invested in men's trousers in this period. It, it really shows you how, how these associations uh, work. And indeed, the ideal woman of the mid-Victorian, mid-19th century uh, was to have an enormous spread of skirt. This broad base was thought, commentators said, to be pleasing to the eye. And women worked all through the 1850s uh, to have more and more uh, wider and wider skirts. This is a cartoon from 1851 by Cruikshank called a, a Splendid Spread. And you can see that this woman has obviously expanded her skirts with layers and layers of petticoats using horsehair, starch stiffening, everything she could. And then there's lots and lots of ruffles to help make the skirt look even bigger. It's so big, in fact, that the waiter here has to hand her something on a sort of long-handled thing because he can't get close enough to hand her um, something in person. Uh, so something new was obviously needed because these layers and layers of petticoats were hot, they were heavy, they had to be laundered, they were expensive, they were thought to be unhealthy, so we need something new. Uh, this is a patent from 1848 for one idea that did not take off really, but it's very clever. Um, the, this patent is for these tubes, rubber tubes around the bottom of a, a petticoat that could be filled with air and hold a skirt out. Or another idea that was talked about was to have these tubes actually filled with water. Now what would be the advantage of that? Well. You can imagine in a time when most houses were heated with open fireplaces and women were wearing these incredibly wide skirts that their, their skirts could catch on fire and indeed some women were burnt to death through their skirts catching on fire. So there was talk, although I'm sure it was never actually done, that if you had these tubes filled with water, all you would have to do if you caught your skirt on fire was to puncture one and you could extinguish the blaze. <laughs> but this was not very practical at all. And Finally, in 1856, the um, sprung steel hoop skirt was introduced. And this was really a marvel of the, the um, technological age, this age of progress. These um, sprung steel um, were very thin, very lightweight, very flexible. They could be covered and then just hung, uh, made in graduated hoops and hung from tapes, grommeted in place, so that the whole thing just collapsed right down like a slinky, but when it hung, hung from the waist could give as much fullness as you wanted to the shape of your skirt. You would then just have to wear one or two petticoats over to sort of smooth the line and you could have this vast expanse of skirt. So all through the late 1850s and into the 1860s, women's skirts got bigger and bigger. And the other miracle of the technological age was that these skirts could now be mass produced in factories and churned out by the hundreds of thousands. Some factories claim to produce 3,000 hoop skirts a day in one factory. So they became much more affordable as um, more uh, people became part of the middle class, more people could afford to participate in fashion, and these hoop skirts became so cheap that everyone could follow fashion. Whereas previously, in the Elizabethan farthingale or the 18th century hoop petticoat, these had been confined to the very elite. This was now a fashion that many could imitate. 
so that you have articles talking about factory girls and housemaids now trying to ape their so-called betters by wearing hoop skirts. And this is an English cartoon on the far side from 1864 showing a maid who you can tell is wearing a very cheap hoop skirt because it only has three hoops and has a very ugly line. But she's trying to dust a Victorian parlor that is absolutely crammed with all the bric-a-brac of the age. And she can't imagine why everything is falling and breaking as she moves about in this enormous skirt. Uh, of course, the Duchess of Wellington uh, in this photograph is showing uh, a much more refined version of the style, but you can see this vast dome now that allowed for all sorts of exaggerated um, decoration. You have the sewing machine uh, perfected by now so that uh, you could uh, really make clothes with, with so much quickly and much more easily. So that indeed to, to cartoonists like Domia on the far side, it seemed as if women were no longer women, they were balloons because their skirts were just so inflated. But there was a problem with these hoop skirts. Uh, they were so lightweight and so bouncy that they could catch on something, they could blow up in a wind, um, so you really could end up revealing much more uh, than was uh, permitted in society. And so this now, for the first time, w respectable women really started to wear underpants or drawers. Uh, but as you can see from the ones below, these are very different than what we think of as underpants. It's a waistband. Uh, with two separate legs that come down below the knee, very baggy and loose, open at the crotch, again, for practical reasons. You wouldn't have to take them off. Uh, but this now is something that can, uh, if, if your hoop skirt got caught or sprung up, you would have something covering your limbs. But the hoop skirt uh, was thought by many women, if it was fairly modest in size, to be a blessing because it, it, you really didn't need all of these petticoats and hot, heavy layers. And some were saying uh, that it, would, it was a fashion they could, thought would endure forever. It was so practical. Uh, so it just shows you that your point of view is really very important in looking at fashions. But already by the mid-1860s, there was more and more emphasis, as you see in the photograph here, on the back of the skirt. And all of the fullness started to shift to the back, and the dome shape started to diminish. So that by about 1870, you have a new area uh, that is emphasized in fashion, the hips and rear of the skirt, and the bustle period begins. Now again, this is, has to do with the conception of what is beautiful and ideal in the female form. The bustle was just thought of as something that, uh, that was in keeping with the women's form. And really, um, you know, many women are uh, shaped this way, although our modern ideal is very different. But it was sort of part of this group consensus about what was aesthetically pleasing. So Corbet, when he depicts the uh, river goddess here in 1868, really paints the bustle onto this woman, into this woman, that uh, makes it part of her flesh because that's thought of as being the ideal. And on the far side, this illustration from an etiquette book from the 1870s shows two views of women. This one, wrong, lack of symmetry. Look at those horribly wide shoulders of that poor woman. Look at those incredibly pathetically thin hips. Here, right, well proportioned, a beautiful sloped shoulder line with very tight fitting sleeves, and then this nice vast expansive skirt below the waist. So, uh, you know, really a, a turnabout um, completely here uh, from many of our modern ideals. And indeed, women uh, could pad, use all sorts of padding to get this vast skirt, which both the hips, the stomach, and of course the back of the skirt were padded. You see the contrast here between the appearance of uh, a dress from the eight, about 1876, and on the far side, a caricature called Appearance and Reality, where this woman is padding everything she possibly can uh, to m get the current feminine ideal. And bustles could be made of just about anything. You had ones like this one that was sort of half a sprung steel hoop skirt. Some were made out of horse hair and gathered. Others were made of springs hung vertically. You could have them made of, of all sorts of uh, fabrics and different manufacturers holding out um, the back of the skirt. And there were various um, various silhouettes that were fashionable through the 20 years of the bustle period. But certainly, if you look at some of the most extreme bustles, like this one from the mid-1880s, it really um, does look like some kind of upholstery um, that is on the back of a, of a woman's figure here, um, helping to give that perfect figure. 
Certainly photographs and um, painters show this ideal, uh, the photograph from 1876 on the near side here, and of course uh, the mid-80s depiction uh, detail from La Grande Jatte by Seurat with that real exaggerated almost right angle at the back of a woman's um, silhouette. And I think if it weren't for photographs, it would almost be hard to believe just how extreme the bustle fashions could be. This is an English actress uh, in the mid-1880s who really has um, a very extreme bustle. And I think that if an alien did come down and saw a woman dressed this way, uh, they might assume that there was a whole separate set of legs back behind. This is a uh, figure made in, in the 1940s by Bernard Rudofsky, who did these wonderful depictions of what one might expect to find underneath fashions of different eras. Of course, the other outstanding feature of late Victorian dress was the corset. On the near side is Manet's Before the Mirror from the mid-1870s, <clears throat> showing this corset and the contrast that it, it allowed. Everything about a woman was to be soft and fleshy with then the contrast of this very tiny waist. And the only way to achieve that is really to bind the waist in separately. On the far side is a, a corset from about 1890 from our collection, <clears throat> a beautiful one decorated with silk embroidery that shows that hourglass shape now. And the whalebone now could be steam molded. And now you'll notice that there's, in addition to the lacing up the back to adjust the corset, there's a front opening busk so that you can put the corset on and take it off by yourself without needing assistance what, once the laces are set. Um, and this, this was um, a new invention as well. But Certainly, the Victorian corsets really made the most out of the female figure. This is an 1873 depiction by Carolus Duran showing this fleshy, soft look that was the ideal everywhere except with this tiny waist. This is a period when uh, Michelle Obama's very muscular arms would have been considered quite unsightly. Uh, everything is to be soft and fleshy and then this tiny, tiny waist. And of course, um, some women took this to extremes. The posed photograph on the far side, done for comic effect, um, makes the most out of trying to achieve this very tiny waist that was so much talked about at, this, at the time and has been talked about a lot ever since. And certainly there were a small group of women who did achieve uh, quite small waists and a, a group of people who fetishized uh, this uh, look too. But the corset had other meanings in society, some of which are still with us today. Uh, the photograph here shows a group of, of people in this candid shot outside in San Francisco in 1877. And if you look at the figure in the light dress here, again, you can really almost see the corset under this woman. Uh, she's, you might say, a straight-laced woman. The woman on the other side, from a few decades later, is... Uh, not perhaps quite of the same uh, type. She is a loose woman uh, without her corset. Now, to most people in the late 19th century, a corset was uh, needed for support. It was rather like we think a woman's bust today needs uh, some support from, from a bra. You needed a, a corset, and it was thought of as being healthy if it was properly fitted. And indeed, some corsets, especially in the 1880s, once electricity had uh, come in, were treated with electricity and were then said to cure all sorts of different diseases. This is kind of one of these uh, fads of the age. But on the far side, this ad shows the angels here delivering Madame Dean's corset to this wonderful group of women below who are so grateful to have this invention. What people, uh, many people didn't like and what was much discussed at the time was actually tight lacing, not the corset itself, but this overemphasis on a very, very tiny waist. So you have uh, cartoons like this one from 1870 where vanity and fashion here are lacing this waist up and the caption here is a la mode, a la mort. And you have uh, depictions of what they call the natural waist at 27 inches and then the fashionable waist said to be at 16 inches. Now, of course, most women didn't get anywhere near this 16 inches. They used instead the laws of proportion. If you have a very full bust and a very full hips, your waist is going to look much smaller. But there was a lot of talk against tight lacing. And reformers, of course, went to the other extreme, showing what a woman uh, before, uh, who wasn't too tightly laced, what her intestines would look like in this drawing. So you can really do anything you want with a drawing to prove your point. And here's what happens to a woman who's uh, too tightly laced. Somehow, her liver and her stomach have, have kind of moved down into her thigh um, because there's not enough space. So, of course, 
Reformers had a valid point about um, not overlacing, but sometimes this, uh, they, they exaggerated to make a point. And you hear a lot of talk, talk about these very, very tiny waists that are just not, um, were not very um, fashionable. And in fact, measuring uh, surviving garments from costume collections proves that most women's waists were nowhere near this 16 or 18 or 19 inches. There were a few at 19 and so forth. But, um, and in, instead, this hourglass figure was really a question of, of emphasizing the other, um, the bust and the hips. Certainly, you can see photos like this one and think uh, back and uh, talk about tight lacing. But just because uh, they hadn't invented photoshopping yet doesn't mean that everything you see is true. Here's another image of a woman with an incredibly tiny waist that you I can see here in the unretouched photo is a small waist, but not as tiny as whoever has retouched that one um, to suit what they thought was ideal. So there were ways of, of uh, achieving a smaller waist even back in the 19th century. And another way that I think mu must have been used too is something like our modern vanity sizing, where manufacturers know that if you have what used to be a size 14, but you call it a four, more women will buy it. Um, if, you'll, if you'll notice here, this is a still from Mybridge's Figures in Motion showing a woman getting dressed and she's closing the front opening busk of her corset, but you can see the back lacing. And it's open a good four inches or so up the back. So I think a woman could buy a 21-inch waist corset and leave it open up the back and still kind of think to herself that she had a 21-inch waist, just like we like to think we're a size four or two or zero or negative, whatever they've got, uh, gotten to now. The other thing that's interesting about the Mybridge photo is this funny looking thing at the back. She has on her drawers here and then out of the, the back of the open crotch she has, has um, folded up and bunched the long skirt of her chemise which is still being worn to give extra padding to the back of the skirt and help support the bustle. So what looks to us very unsightly had a practical reason as well. This is a, a very nice um, chemise and drawer set from uh, Philadelphia's collection, which is beautifully uh, dated here uh, with the, in indelible ink, the laundry mark, Sally B. Houston, number 18. It was very important that you number it so that you can get the correct thing back from the laundry, and dated November 18, 84, from her trousseau. This happens to have closed crotch drawers, which were uh, an alternative at this time, although open crotch drawers or remains the most popular into the early 20th century. But something new is starting to happen to women's undergarments in the 1870s and 80s. They're getting more and more elaborate. They're starting to have much more lace and frills and ribbons and all of that kind of thing that we think of as lingerie rather than just being sort of practical starched garments. And this, indeed, and the newness of these drawers is what's being shown off in the dancers of the Can-Can um, at uh, Moulin Rouge and what's shown in uh, Toulouse-Lautrec's 1891 depiction here is you have these exotic erotic drawers and all of this frills and frippery that's now starting to be part of feminine undergarments. But there were other new trends in the late 19th century too. Increasingly women were participating in sports and in the 1890s there was a real craze for bicycling that, so that this china doll, the very simpering china doll of the early Victorian period was giving way to a much more athletic figure. And you have uh, underwear now taking account of that. This is an ad from 1896 for the new woman, this much more athletic woman, in a, a corset or corset waist that is corded but not nearly as constrictive as corsets worn for every day. And you have other new trends as well uh, that were a benefit to some women. This is a page from the 1897 Sears catalog. Now you can buy disposable sanitary napkins rather than having to use linen napkins that had to be uh, laundered, so a great boon to many women. And uh, by the end of the 19th century, you really have a very different figure than you had in the earlier mid-19th century. This is Sargent's depiction of Mr. and Mrs. I. N. Phelps from 1897, and certainly this woman is very strong, assertive, uh, much more athletic um, than those simpering early Victorian women. But just because we turn a century does not mean that everything changes. So into the early 20th century, you still mainly have this emphasis on a very curvaceous feminine figure, as you see on the actress Anna Held on the far side. She was accused of causing sexual unrest with her extremely curvaceous figure. 
And indeed, the first decade of the 20th century is one of the most constrictive in terms of feminine underwear. And this ad from 1905 makes that very clear. It's first of all called the FP pinch in waist. It tells you right there what it's going to do. And it says that it has this special band across the waist that promises it will not stretch out no matter how tight you lace it to get a small waist. The ideal feminine figure in this Edwardian period was extremely curvaceous, the actress Camille Clifford on the far side, showing that even though the bustle has disappeared, there's still a great emphasis on the rear and this very full rounded chest, a very matronly figure. Uh, and you can accentuate that with this beautiful S curve where you stand by thrusting your um, bust and your rear out to give this, this beautiful ideal. And of course, if you can't achieve it yourself, underwear can help you. All you need to do, according to this 1905 ad, is to wear a hose supporter. That's, this is one from our collection. This goes around the waist and holds your stockings up in the front. But what it does then is force you into this S-curve. So here is this woman without the Venus hose supporter. Poor thing. And here she is transformed into the perfect S-curve all through the miracle of this simple garment. But there were many changes uh, happening in the early 20th century. First of all, there was much greater communication and transportation. The automobile had been invented. This is a page from an early etiquette book that assures the reader that it is in as good taste for a lady to drive as for a man, so women were getting out more. There is continuing redefinition of women's position in society as more women are working now outside the home and um, increasingly agitating for the right to vote, as this woman is doing. So that by about 1910, you have a whole new um, ideal of uh, Femi the fem female figure. That curvaceous figure is now really out of date and a much narrower line comes in with skirts that really fit tightly over the hips. This is those, uh, some Poiré designs from about 1910. So now that women's hips are being much more in view, uh, you need to have uh, the corset kind of go down and help to smooth that area. And indeed, of course, it's really slunk down on the figure so far that uh, one cartoonist called it the spat corset as they're getting lower and lower. But when they slink down, they leave the feminine bust line without any kind of support or um, improvement. And this paves the way for what comes to be the defining garment of the 20th century, the brassiere. The brassiere had been invented earlier, but really came into uh, mainstream fashion by about 1910, but in a very different shape than we think of it. Again, it gives you that monobosom, that very rounded top to bottom, side to side, it comes to the waist. Uh, the on the far side is one from the Philadelphia's collection, showing the typical form of the brassiere uh, that uh, is to evolve as the uh, feminine dramatically in the 20th uh, century. Certainly, uh, by the 1920s, there was a very different ideal. The emphasis now on youth. Uh, skirts were shortened. For really the first time in, in Western history, you could see how women moved around. They no longer had this, in, this full-length skirt that they just seemed to glide around. You could see them walking. There was a very boyish figure, much younger. Uh, all of these changes reflected in the clothes and the undergarments so that by the mid-20s you have advertisements for the brassiere here emphasizing girlish form brassieres on this athletic women playing tennis, really more boyish form brassieres. And on the far side, another one of those sort of miracle improving garments, uh, an ad that you find at the back of magazines just as you do today, um, for women who previously had th thought themselves so lucky to be well endowed, now they're, they're drastically trying to reduce their bust uh, during the daytime, and this garment promises that it will do that if you only send no money but order it today. For those who were young and had ideal figures, the uh, typical underwear might consist of a brassiere like this one from 1929 from our collection, which is really just a piece of chiffon with lace over it, no shaping, nothing to uh, support the figure. Indeed, it, it really um, gives no support at all. But of course, many women still wanted some help to achieve the ideal and continued to wear uh, corsets or what we might think of as girdles, uh, such as these sold by the Sears catalog in 1923. 
And increasingly, in the early uh, 20th century, there is more and more influence from the film industry, as you have people going to, to the movies and seeing uh, what is uh, being worn on the screen, there the, these uh, glamorous stars wearing things. Uh, here we have a, <clears throat> a wonderful bias cut dress on Norma Shear that clings to the figure, so uh, undergarments have to evolve as uh, the, the female figure has these very uh, clingy garments and all in ones which combine the brassiere and girdle into one are now becoming more common. And increasingly, more and more people able to participate in fashion so that there's um, clothes available at, at all price points. The Sears catalog from 1933 selling women's underpants as low as 22 cents for those who could um, send in to get them and they could be delivered uh, throughout the country. On the total other end of the scale, you have luxury garments now, like this beautiful pair of step-ins uh, from the Philadelphia collection from a trousseau from 1931. Uh, silk satin, all handmade, handmade lace, and embroidered with the name of the rich uh, young bride, uh, Betty, on them. So the two ends of the spectrum, but not that dissimilar in shape. Of course, skipping very quickly through the 20th century, uh, with the advent of the Second World War, many women assumed positions in factories and supporting the troops that, that had previously been foreign to them, as there's now more and more of an emphasis on women um, helping out. And a very masculine silhouette with these enormous shoulder pads that you see on Ida Lupino on the far side, uh, and shorter skirts, much more straight line skirts as the war effort really gets into full production. Although many women were reminded uh, that they should also uh, dress very flatteringly to remind the troops what they were fighting for. And one of my favorite ads of, of all time from 1943, of course, underwear manufacturers were in a bit of a bind at the time because many of the materials they used, like rubber and other things, were conscripted for war purposes. But somehow, and don't ask me how, this wearing this um, panty girdle uh, by quarters will help defeat Hitler, Mussolini, and the Japanese emperor uh, as you're right in line for freedom. Certainly, many new technologies coming into play here that will be uh, much more exploited after the war, like the introduction of nylon, which of course revolutionized um, stockings. But after the war, women, it was expected, would return to their traditional position of the home and family. And there's a great emphasis in the 19, uh, late 40s through the early 60s on this return to a very curvaceous feminine ideal. You see it in ads like this one for the Peter Pan bra from 1947, the merry-go-round bra, the secrets in the circle. And I love the way that they sort of photograph from below to make uh, the most out of all of the feminine assets. And of course, Dior's famous new look in 1947 that returns to the full bust line, nipped in waist and very full long skirt that had been um, popular uh, before the war. So women in the 50s and early 60s were expected to be very curvaceous and sex goddesses uh, to have what the Janssen ad here calls curvelure, the small difference between girl and glamour girl. And of course the famous maiden form campaign from the late 50s into the 60s. Here she's dreaming she drove maiden form bra. But at the same time that you were supposed to be a sex goddess in this torpedo bras, women were expected to remember that they should always be ladies. This is really my favorite ad of all time uh, from Vogue in 1954. The woman here with her matching pearls, her white gloves, her coordinated ac accessories is always a lady, even when choosing her beer. And that's what this ad is for. <laughs> Because after all, every man wants his woman on a pedestal, as the ad from 1961 for this nylon penoir set has it. But of course, that ideal too is tossed aside in the later 60s as a whole new emphasis on youth comes in. The very um, slight figure of Twiggy shown here, the young generation who wants to do your own thing with dresses like this plastic dress by Betsy Johnson that lets you rearrange the shape and express yourself. And indeed, underwear manufacturers are really um, exploiting the fact that, that less is more at this time. 
Women now no longer had to wear a girdle or a garter belt to hold up their stockings since pantyhose was introduced in the early 1960s. As this ad says, now you have a choice. And on, in 1970, the ad for this pantyhose, which was called scanty hose, had the caption, less is more. So for a while, it really seemed like underwear and clothes, perhaps, would disappear altogether as uh, hippies redefined fashion and a sort of space age look came in. Maybe we'd all be wearing um, unisex unitards in the future or very little underwear like the thong bikini underpants from the 1980s. But now that women no longer had outer uh, underwear to reshape themselves, increasingly they're expected to reshape their figures on your own. Without a girdle, you're expected to exercise until you have buns of steel, as this ad from the early 90s has it. Or, if that doesn't work, to have surgery uh, to correct your figure flaws so that you can conform to the contemporary ideal. Women were increasingly assuming more and more position in the business world. The Women's Dress for Success book was published in uh, 1977, telling women how to get ahead in business. And underwear manufacturers like Jockey introduced Jockey for her in the mid-'80s. That was based on men's underwear, very practical, something you could wear that was comfortable. And they were incredibly successful uh, very soon. But women uh, to show their power also adopted other things like incredible shoulder pads. This is a Valentino from the mid-1980s that shows uh, a pirouette silhouette now but just inverted from this very wide shoulders which proportionally makes the hips look slimmer which is what women wanted at the time. And I think the shoulder pad um, fad has some interesting things to say about women's role in society. This is an ad for a foam rubber shoulder pad called Pints of Pads that the um, um, the owner, the uh, founder of the company started and marketed in ice cream, co uh, ice cream um, cartons because she, that she got originally from the deli downstairs. So this ad from 1986 contrasts this woman's foam rubber shoulder pad with the real muscle of a man and interestingly says an illusion of strength. <laughs> And underwear manufacturers were very savvy at the time, too. Victoria Seifert was one who um, exploited the idea of do it for yourself. This isn't necessarily something you're doing for someone else. Indulge yourself, escape with this romantic idea of underwear so that a woman was expected to be a businesswoman during the day, a sex goddess at night, and then um, physically train and wear, um, wear the underwear so that she could jog and keep herself uh, physically fit as well. So many different roles in the late uh, 20th century. And, and increasingly, underwear was seen on the outside as well. Uh, stars and celebrities and designers realized that to the modern audience, underwear is actually more shocking than the nude body. Uh, Madonna in her Gautier corset on her Blonde Ambition tour that um, it was really more shocking when her pinstripe suit jacket was slid open to reveal this underwear than it would have been to see the naked body in our contemporary society. And you could get a lot of attention with underwear. On the far side, Elizabeth Hurley arrives at an event in a Versace red dress that is slit incredibly high to reveal her Versace leopard print underwear and got a lot of attention and publicity uh, from it. And I think Really, the most extraordinary thing to me is that she wore this outfit to the wedding of friends. Uh, so, uh, standards are slipping. And certainly, uh, designers are looking back to underwear increasingly in the late 20th and into the 21st century. You have Miyake's bustier that redefines the corset and makes it this, um, this statement that's almost like a sculpture in itself. It's, uh, it's something that you slip on, like you put on a bracelet over your your wrist uh, and gives you that shape. And designers uh, like Chloe in the 1990s using underwear uh, as outerwear, making a corset top dress, of course, without the, the chemise that would have been underneath. But underwear is also more and more seen as designers uh, rush to put their names around the, the um, tops of underwear, and people are surprisingly willing to pay much more for someone else's name. And, uh, even panties making their way as, as this Victoria's Secret uh, ad from uh, 2003 has, 
fashion's newest accessory, so you can show off the back of your thong bikini underwear and the jewels that adorn it. And indeed, we've seen recently perhaps a bit too much of underwear, uh, or what are sometimes called whale tails on the, the, um, the fe <laughs> in public. Um, perhaps we don't, really don't need to see quite this much. But certainly, our ideal of the ideal uh, female body here is, is something like this one still. This is a, a model, a, a really emaciated model in a Chanel micro bikini um, that's, that's come to be accepted as what we see every day in fashion magazines and on celebrities. Uh, so now we have these constraints in this wonderful New Yorker cartoon from 2003 on the far side that has the one woman saying to the other, to the other, I used to hate my body. Now instead, I hate the forces that conspire to make me hate my body. <laughs> Certainly, we still have many of the garments from the past. We've just given them new names and done them in new fabrics. This might look to you like a panty girdle, but in the 1990s, Victoria's Secret marketed it as the body shaper bike short, a modern name. And of course, Spanx have now come in and um, are not thought of as being a girdle anymore, but something that just gives you that little extra help you need. So in conclusion, it all depends on how you look at underwear. It can be, as this Victoria's Secret ad has it, a miracle that can transform you into a model of loveliness, or as this wonderful ad for the magic ring bra has it, this barbed wire bra, the caption on top reads, shortly after the introduction of the first underwire bra, Valium was invented. <laughs> Coincidence? Thank you very much.